This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Good morning, good morning. It's a beautiful Monday here in Mississippi. Carol, how are you this morning? Malcolm, I'm doing just great. How about you? All is well here in the basement on Gillespie Street. Uh, I had to chuckle uh, with meteorologist Sally Russell described the weather this morning in culinary terms. She said it is thick and sticky, kind of like figs, Carol. Yeah, kind of like figs. And Malcolm, I know about figs. I have been in full figurama. This week, uh, a figurama. A figurama. Yeah. Uh, not, not on, I, I baked thirteen fig tarts. Why thirteen? Well, because there were thirteen people that my significant other, John Palmer, wanted to give them to. We've been uh, isolated. We've been you know, quarantined out in Edwards during this uncertain, strange time, and. We just wanted to reach out to some friends and neighbors who hadn't seen us since March. So we we fig-bombed them. That's a beautiful thing. You know, you could have done 15, and then Java and I could have had a Well, I'm I'm going to, those are my I'm just saying. Well, I ran out of figs. Oh, okay. But uh, but there will be more. Uh, And I know that Felder actually brought Java some fig preserves, and that caught my attention because I want to be the one to give Java fig products. So I'll have his tart ready for him uh, next week. But now, yeah, wait, we have to stop right here before we talk about food and talk about the news about you. It's been all over the newspapers, the radio, television, and I saw that you got 237 comments on Facebook. So tell us, hey, what's going on, Mal? Wow. Uh, well, I announced last week that I would be uh, wrapping up my state service and stepping down as the director of the Mississippi Arts Commission after a 15-year stint in public service, 12 years at the Arts Commission, three as a state tourism director, and I am uh, joyfully returning to the private sector. So thank you for bringing that up. Well, it, it really touched me. I read all of the Facebook comments. I just, you know, clicked on there and, and I saw there were over 200 people from all over everywhere that that wished you well and talked about your contribution. And I, I know that had to be very touching for you. Absolutely. And I greatly appreciate both the opportunity to serve at the Arts Commission and everyone's outpouring of good wishes. I did have to go in and clarify that I'm not, quote unquote, retiring. I'm just stepping back from state service and I will be fully engaged, uh, as you can only imagine, in a multitude of activities and enterprises. And I hope one of those is cooking. You know I'm going to be cooking. (laughs) But you come from a family that is steeped in public service. Yeah, yeah. My dad. I thought about that. You know, I I come from a family of uh, school teachers and public servants. Uh, My father uh, began his career as a classroom teacher and as a coach. Uh, and ultimately became president of a community college, uh, spent his entire adult life uh, in state service, public service. And I never imagined that I would do that. As you know, I was 53 years old uh, before uh, I took this job with the Arts Commission. And it was really kind of uh, something I thought I'd do for three years uh, because of Hurricane Katrina. And lo and behold, I stuck around for 15. So that's all. That's all a beautiful thing. So September yeah. 30th uh, is my last day at the Arts Commission, and I know you and the other commissioners are busy at work trying to find uh, the next leadership for the Mississippi Arts Commission. Well, we will do that, but they have big shoes and 
Also a baseball cap to fill. That's right. Many baseball caps, whether you have it on frontwards or backwards. Backwards. So what are you cooking? You know, uh, last night, Kara came up with this idea that she wanted to have meatballs. Uh, A friend had given us a jar of pesto that she made. So Kara came up with this idea that she would work the pesto into the meatballs and, and that she would have me cook them. And she didn't want them fried. She wanted them cooked on the grill. She wanted grill meatballs. So last night I took the fish, I took the fish basket and put it on its highest setting and put the meatballs in the fish basket, clamped it down, uh, built a beautiful fire and grill those pesta infused meatballs outside on the grill. And then we had a meal of pasta with the tomato sauce, the grilled pesto infused meatballs, and uh, a big old platter of grilled uh, vegetables, mostly peppers that was done inside uh, in the oven. Well, had never heard of any grilled meatballs, so that's a first. What about you? That's a first. Oh, uh, well, besides the 13 big tarts, I kind of had an Indian food craving. Oh, and, yeah. You know, we're in a place where you can't just run to Spice Avenue or a local Indian restaurant and get and get food. So I actually made a curry chicken that I got from Bob LaCour on our Cooking and Coping Facebook page. And then I did uh, bindi masala, which is my favorite Indian recipe. It is a spicy okra, okra and tomatoes Mm. and onions. Bindi means okra, and there's a lot of okra going on in Indian cooking. Yeah, and a lot of people are posting about okra as well as figs uh, on cooking and coping. Yeah, when we when we talk when we have more time to talk about figs, I was going to read off some of the recipes that uh, I mean, not the recipes, but the fig dishes we've seen on the Cooking and Coping Facebook site. It's absolutely uh, amazing. And let's see if I have one here. But uh, there were about 40 different people making, uh, you know, making this stuff. And there's a woman in Jackson named Mary uh, Woodard who posted a fig bunt cake. And ah, it, I saw that. It, yeah, it set the site on fire. So there are uh, many, many uh, bunt cakes and people thanking her for the recipe. And I have to admit, I was one of those that that made it. But um, I have some some personal news to report. One of our listeners, and happens to be a friend from Nashville, Tennessee, Thomas Williams, sent me this Duke's mayonnaise face mask ah. very very proud of it i'm i'm going to wear it with great pride and then ann roberts of Asheville, north carolina sent me a wonderful duke's pen it's a it's a like a piece of jewelry that uh, someone she knows makes up there so i feel like you know a lucky girl this morning well, not only that, but at this point in time, you, you have to be committed to Dukes, and certainly Hellman should never, never be consumed by you ever again. Well, you know, I, I feel it, it, it's really rewarding that I, I planted my flag with Dukes mayonnaise, and look what's come of it. We got a caller on the line. Um, I believe it's a, a friend from Beaumont. Uh, Java, who, who is this? Oh, Sue. Hey, Sue. Oh, Sue from Beaumont. How you doing? <laughs> I, I want to tell you all about uh, your mentioning meatballs. Uh, can I make a quick mention of meatballs again? Of course. Okay. A, a lady taught me this. Uh, I had always, like, fried, cook my meatballs in the oven or something before putting them in the sauce. But she taught me that if you roll your meatballs out and you have your, your spaghetti sauce simmering on the stove, just have it at, at a good bubble. You know, you drop your meatballs in there. You don't crowd them, but just drop it's enough in a pot, you drop your meatballs in there, and just uh, put the lid on. You don't stir them until they've had time to firm up in the sauce, and uh, then you give them a little stir, and then they'll finish cooking in that sauce, and you don't have to cook them first before you put them in the sauce. 
Yeah, that that's a great tip. I, in fact, when I was uh, grilling these meatballs last night over the charcoal, I thought, what are all the possible ways that you could prep your meatballs? And one was you don't cook them at all. We, you do what Sue just suggested, and that is you roll them up, you know, season them and prepare them, and then just gently drop them into your, your, your tomato gravy, your pasta sauce, and, and let them cook totally in the sauce. And then, you know, their uh, juices merge with your sauce. The other one is to cook them first on the side, uh, like Mary Tuminella taught me to do, uh, cook them in Crisco and then add them to the sauce. And then now we have this third way of uh, putting them in a fish uh, rack <laughs> and grilling them on the barbecue grill and then adding them to your sauce. So I'm sure there are other ways as well. That sounds great. Well, thank you very much. No, thank you for listening, and thank you for calling. Carol, did, we had a bit of update from Adrian Miller, who was on the show the other day before we go on break. What, what's Adrian? Yeah, uh, well, you know, Adrian, as you know, is out in Denver, Colorado, a very active member of the Southern Foodways Alliance in Oxford, and he is known as the Soul Food Scholar mm. because of his, of his first book, but he shared the news, the good news with all of us, that his new book was accepted for publication by the University of North Carolina Press. And he talked about the book he was writing on the, on the show. It's called United States of Barbecue. And we'll follow him through this process. Next spring should have a finished book and uh, will certainly help spread the word. But you know, Mississippi doesn't have its an actual barbecue tradition like you know, North Carolina and Tennessee and, and Kansas City, nor a sauce tradition. But we have some of the best barbecue around, yeah, of of all kinds. So I uh, I hope he'll be mentioning Mississippi in the book. Yeah. Well, we wish Adrian a lot of luck with this book, uh, and he was a fantastic guest. If you're interested in that show, you can go back and look at the podcast. Uh, and and Andri Adrian Miller was, was on the show a few weeks back. Really fascinating guy. Look forward to having him on again. Okay, at this time, it's, uh, it's time for first break. And when we come back, we're going to have the Gestalt Gardener on. The one and only Felder Rushing is going to join us. And talk about what's uh, growing this time of year in both his garden and, and talk about a concept that I hear him talk about all the time on his show, and that is it's not too late for a second harvest this summer. He, he suggests it's still a good time to plant. So stay tuned for that. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, professor of internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. You're tuned to Deep South Dining right here on MPB Think Radio. Malcolm White with Carol Puckett, and this is the show. All about the culture of Southern flavor. Welcome back, Carol. Thanks, Mal. How, how are things down in the basement? Nice and quiet, except for the neighbors uh, barking dogs next door. I don't know if our listeners can hear that, but uh, I have some relatively new neighbors. And uh, they have these little dogs, and they put them out on the uh, deck uh, about this time every morning. And they just barky, 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 barky. So I don't know. I may be... Uh, speaking uh, over an orchestra of yapping dogs. But other than that, it's pretty quiet. So what are you cooking today? Uh, you know, I haven't cooked anything today. I ate a peach uh, that was in the refrigerator uh, that was very ripe. Uh, but so far, I haven't uh, turned on the stove this morning. Have you? It's a little early. It's a little early, but I'm going to get started as soon as we finish. Yeah, same here. All right. If you are a regular listener to MPB Think Radio, then you will recognize this uh, 
our next guest. His Friday show, The Gestell Gardner, Gardner, is probably the most popular and uh, highly renowned show on the air. He's the one and only Felder Rushing. And Felder, thank you so much for joining us this good, morning. Good morning. Ain't it a great morning? Hey, Carol. <laughs> hey, Felder. How are you and where are you? Well, I'm actually wondering, you know, because of the, the virus thing, this is my first summer in 11 or 12 to not be in England. So I've been uh, in Mississippi gardening. I actually planted summer vegetables, and I've been eating them. So I'm proving to myself I can walk the walk, not just talk the talk. Well, so good to hear from you. And I, I have to say, Java sent, sent us a picture of a jar of fig preserves you gave him. And so I knew you were busy. Okay, now those weren't the prettiest figs. I picked them myself. Is a friend of mine who lives in uh, in Jackson had a big old tree, and I walked. I picked three gallons of figs without getting my feet off the ground, without having to use a rake or anything. And I put up about oh ten pints, and you know some of the little yuppie half pints that I give to my Yankee <laughs> friends because you know you can buy Vermont maple syrup at any piggly wiggly Mississippi, but you got to know somebody to get homemade fig preserves. That is exactly right. <laughs> well, Felder, how about you walk us through how you made your preserves? A lot of people, I'm sure, have a lot of recipes, family recipes, different techniques. How does Felder yeah. Rushing make fig preserves? It, you know, and, and, and I, I got to say this. When I was 10 years old, and I'm, I'm pushing 70, I'm 68. When I was 10 years old, my great-grandmother had me help her put up fig preserves on a wood stove in the Delta in July. So I started out wow. as what we call horticultural hell. So, <laughs> so, so what I do now, though, because all the recipes, including my great grandmother's, is mushy stuff. It was more sugar than anything. Uh, what I like to do is is uh, is uh, cut the stems off of them. I boil them in uh, water with a little sugar until you know you can see through them. I use about half the sugar that recipes call for, uh, so I can taste the figs. But in order to preserve them, you have to have something. I add extra lemon. The lemon, you know, lowers this, the pH that makes it acidic. But so mine's more like a lemon fig preserve with less sugar. I throw a little cinnamon in there just for a little, you know, to make you close one eye when you eat it. Do yeah, you, uh, our, our preserves sound pretty much alike. I, I know a lot of these recipes, you use equal amounts of figs and sugar. Yeah, and, you cover, and, and, cover them with and sugar, and that's fine. But you can buy that kind of crap. You know, you got you want to make something that that you know is your now. What what the stuff that Java got? Unfortunately, the the figs are a little bit overripe. They they fell apart. So it's not real pretty little plump plums in there. It's more like a jam, I guess, and preserves because they cook the pieces. But well, I, really I think like, he was pretty happy with it. But you know, <laughs> I the way I learned is is that you take. Say, say if you have 12 cups of figs, you use six cups of sugar and then three cups of water. So you half it down. So it really has about half the sugar, some recipes. I, I use, use even less than I'm that. I'm a lemon I, advocate, too. Yeah, I use even less than that. But again, in order to make it preserve well, you know, you, you have to... You know, you have to, to do, Malcolm, you know, it's science as much as anything, but I add a little extra lemon to, to uh, make sure it preserves well. But anyway, this is this is my first year in like 10 or 12 to actually be able to pick figs, and it's hard to find them. I mean, we, we used to have some pick-your-own-fig places in or, around the state, but now I noticed that the farmer's market in Jackson, the old farmer's market yesterday, uh, they're starting to come in with some kind of small figs, but they've got figs for sale, and I think eight dollars for a gallon of figs. Uh, you know, you can make a couple of three pints of uh, preserves, and uh, you know, have have fun. Hey Felder, on your recipe, uh, when you say lemon, do you use just the lemon juice, or do you put the rinds uh, and the oh, lemon I, uh, I, in I, it I, itself? I, I cut the, the lemons up real thin rinds because you know I like that little extra. Like I say, you know, food is is uh, more than just nourishment and fuel. It's also all also about you know rolling your eyes up to heaven or squinting an eye and that kind of stuff. And that real bit, bit of candied lemon in there is really really nice. It's not much. Okay, so you, so you put lemon slices in there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, Felder, uh, talk yeah. to us a little bit about the different fig trees around Mississippi, the different varieties that you see. Well, you know, this is everybody has always grown just fig. And when they say fig, they mean the old brown turkey. 
which is uh, it's a great plant, but it's iffy. You know, sometimes it loses its first crop and has a second crop. Uh, but it's a standard old old fig everybody grew. But uh, there's a whole bunch of other varieties. Uh, Louisiana came out with one that's golden, one that's purple. Uh, I don't think they make good figs, but my favorite uh, two figs is one called, um, I'm just drawing a total blank, Celeste. starts with a C. Celeste is an absolute, utter, dependable, producing fig. So I am always say a plant of Celeste and then put every else you want out there. Celeste will always produce. And then I've got one that, that a, an old family from Jackson named Cazares uh, came up with, uh, with a fig from the old country. And they just call it Cazares fig. And the carol is bigger than an egg. I mean, they're huge. They're sweet. Oh, my gosh. That little, that little hole in the bottom is plugged up with what, what must, must be pure honey. But, uh, hey, and, you, and know, Phil, you know, Phil, I have one of those Cazares trees uh, <clears throat> they gave me about five years ago. I took it down to the coast and I planted it in my yard in Bay St. Louis and uh-huh. nothing really ever happened. So I dug it up on my birthday two years ago, brought it up to Jackson, replanted it. And this year for the very first time, that thing is, is putting out those monster figs. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing that. By, by the way, here's two oddball things about figs from a, from a horticulture point of view. Uh, first of all, they'll make trees, but I, I planted one, uh, oh, about three. I'm looking at it right now. And uh, I cut my plants back to about two feet tall when I set them out, and that makes them bush out. And those are going to be the trunks for the re- rest of the life. Then every year when they put out growth, I cut the new growth back a little bit to make it bush out. So I have a fig bush that I can walk ah. around. And, and, and it's, a, it's a good garden texture, you know, big coarse texture leaf. It looks good as a yard plant. But if you prune it, just cut the, snip the tips off the new growth every spring, it will stay nice and compact with more figs. So, you know, uh-huh. and then, and then the, the, uh, the other oddball thing about it, a lot of people think of figs as having seeds in them because they've been raised on fig newtons and all. The figs that we have here, uh, figs are pollinated by little flies. That little hole in the bottom opens up, a little fly goes in and pollinates. It's an inside-out flower. But we don't have that fly here in Mississippi like they do in California. So our figs don't have those seeds like, like, like you do when you buy, you know, uh, store-bought figs from California. Isn't that a stupid huh. thing? No Knowing that the little fly crawls around inside of a fig, an inside mm-hmm. out. F- yeah, fruit. you know, you well, open it up. Cool. You know, when you open Elder, a fig, look at, my look biggest kind of problem crazy. with figs is is I have a hard time beating the birds to them. Yeah, well, I try, you had a I try to get out right before sunrise, and you know, sunrise now is a little bit after six, so I'll try to get out there. At, <laughs> quarter till or 10 to 6 but the birds get up way earlier than i do oh yeah well what about the possums and all that kind of stuff no the the, the if you keep it like a like a bush and when they start to ripen throw one of these nets over it uh bird netting and close it up with clothespins in the bottom because we have you know i've, I've got raccoons in my yard and uh and the possums love pigs too so anyway it's you know we got to learn to share just learn to share and if you got a, a nice little <laughs> compact bushy type thing it's a lot easier to keep the pests off with a with an. That's what commercial growers do. They keep them. Uh, you go to fig uh, real commercial fig places. They're big bushes, and they throw insect uh, bird netting over them, and you know, no big deal. But well, I don't mind sharing with the birds and the possums and the raccoons, but I just want us to be fair about it. Yeah, I mean, I want yeah. Well, to leave me just a few. Not everybody plays by the rules. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And the early bird gets the fig, Carol, so you're just going to have to get up a little bit earlier. (laughs) That's right. Hey, Felder. Little bird told us that you made your first blueberry cobbler the other day and that you went down to J.D. Farms in Poplarville and got yourself some blueberries. Tell us about that experience. Well, you know, we we have a lot of great pick your own, but a whole I, I advocate people growing certain kind of fruit plants as just good looking yard plants. Forget the fact they have fruit, but they they, they look good in yard. And figs and blueberries are in there, uh, but I'm gone most of the time, so I don't plant stuff. Uh, but anyway, I went down to JD Farms. They're the tea people, Mississippi. They, they've got the Pearl River Tea Company, and they have right. huge blueberries. I mean, they're just incredible, great big. They're big as the end of my thumb. I did that and. Then a couple of weeks ago, I went up to Calhoun County uh, to, a, to a small mom-and-pop place uh, called Murphy's Orchard, and I got some homegrown peaches that hadn't been dipped in a bunch of fungicides and stuff, and I made my first-ever homemade peach pie. 
you know, now I'm an old guy. You think I've done this before, but I made a peach pie, peach cobbler, fig preserves, and uh, today I'm making from my, my front yard, I'm making a cornbread squash dressing. Oh, boy. Yeah, that sounds good delicious. For you. And, you know, you're and bringing I, up I, a point talking about about cooking right now. During uh, this recent unpleasantness with the coronavirus, yeah. so many people are, are doing cooking like you're talking about for the first time, you know, preserving and uh, making cobblers and pies and using the, the bounty of the season. It, it's, it's just amazing. And, and bread making has become a huge deal for the first about two and a half months of the uh, the quarantine and the pan- pandemic, you could hardly get flour, and then yeast was almost impossible to get. Hey, try, try finding try finding canning lids right now. I mean, you know all the, yeah. You know, I mean, all, all the main stores, the, the big ones, they're canning supply stuff. And a lot of these people, just like first time gardeners, they don't know what they're doing, but they're having a good time, and, and that's what we want to encourage. And they're learning. But uh, no, the canning supplies are uh, are low too. Yeah, I ha- I had to go on a search last week because you know I ran out of lids and yeah. I found some at Gaddis McLaurin in Bolton, Mississippi, which is uh-huh. just one of the great old time you know yeah. hardware feed stores. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I, I felt like I'd really really run into some treasure. Well, let me let me let me tell you one other thing. I, I, I and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about figs, but I, in my little garden, I'm standing out front front yard. I've got a flower bed that's got texture and color and shapes and all, uh, and there's no flowers. I've got uh, purple basil. I've got burgundy okra. I've got squash, corn, tomatoes, peppers, all growing around a bottle tree. It looks like just a regular flower bed. It's colorful, texture, and everything, every single thing of it I can eat off of. And so I've been growing vegetables this summer for the first time in over a decade. I've been experimenting with, with uh, vegetables as flowers, and they look incredible when you plant them in groups like that instead of long, skinny rows like we were raised with. And you can do it huh. in containers. You know, you can put uh, four or five different kinds of vegetables and herbs in a big pot, and it looks great, and it's cool, <laughs> you know, when you when you entertain. Hey, Felder, I got a quick question about blueberries. Uh, for those yeah. of us who live in town or urban gardeners and have small yards, is it true that you need at least three blueberry bushes for them to make? No. No. <laughs> one, okay. One, so one will do it. One, one will do it, but if you have two or more different varieties, they pollinate. Some bloom a little earlier, later than others. So if you have two or more different varieties, you have a longer season and more fruit set. Okay. But you and can go are, with the solo bush. Yeah, sure, uh, sure you can. Or, or, or get this. Uh, dig an extra wide hole and put two or three different bushes in the same hole. It's okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. They, Good they, advice. You know, they, yeah. You know, it's, uh, can I can I share one last little anecdote? Absolutely. I put my my uh, my bucket of uh, of uh, overripe figs and the cuttings and the peelings outside my porch the other night. Next morning, I went out there and there was a baby possum that had gotten in it, and it fallen oh. in. And he couldn't get out. He was he was up to his belly, going around around. He turned that stuff into mush, and I had to take a hose to him. His his hair was sticking straight out, <laughs> sticky with stuff. He had fruit flies. Stuck in his fur, and I'm calling him Punk Possum. But, but punk <laughs> he was possum. he was drunk on the nectar of fresh fruit, Felder. And and he had that sticky stuff made his his you know, he he was just like a punk hairdo with fruit flies stuck to it. It was, it was fantastic. And I don't know if he was I don't know if he was happy or not, but he seemed to be. <laughs> Is that something? Right. Like? That's terrific. That's a great story. So be careful what you put out and what it might attract. We're going to take That's a break right. now. Felder Rushing will be back with us uh, when we come back. We'll continue to talk about uh, summer vegetables and whether or not there's time for another planting. We'll certainly talk about figs and cobblers, peaches and blueberries and everything in between. Uh, we'll talk about tarts and sweet dishes and cobblers and pies. We'll take your calls if you're interested. Pick it up, 1-877-MPB-RING. For Felder or Carol or Java or myself, any question is a good question. 1-877-672-7464 or shoot us an email to food at mpbonline.org. 
O-R-G. We'll be right back. I'm Allison Walker, the lady auto mechanic, host of AutoCorrect. If you're enjoying this podcast, try my podcast, AutoCorrect. We help steer you in the right direction with your car problems. Find me on any podcast platform or at autocorrect.mpbonline.org. You're tuned to Deep South Dining right here on MPB Think Radio. Malcolm White with Carol Puckett. Also on our show today, our very special guest, Felder Rushing. And we're going to talk about uh, fruits and we're going to talk about vegetables. We're going to talk about the, the bounty that comes from the plants and Felder, welcome back. Thank you, sir. I, you know, I, I wish I could, you know, talk about bounty. If I put a dollar amount on the corn that I harvested last week, I, I've got a, a, a little small suburban lot, but uh, this year I dug up a, a little raised bed three feet wide by, I don't know, maybe 20 feet long, and I planted corn and squash and beans and peas and sweet potatoes and tomatoes and peppers, and I got three ear of corn, and at state, <laughs> at state fair prices, that's fifteen dollars worth of corn, <laughs> Woo! and and they weren't that great. They weren't that great, but I grew them. I grew them, so I feel better than my neighbors. Okay, have you cooked with your corn yet? Yes, yes. Uh, one of them was a little bit over. It was pretty pretty starchy when I did. I just I just boil them and put uh, salt and, be- and pepper and butter on them like to do at state fair. It might have been a better well, way. Well, well, I I ran into on our facebook site cooking and coping people were doing all sorts of great corn things and one of the things i saw was a corn fritter and i made those last week and they are absolutely delicious so i highly recommend uh just going on the internet and looking up corn fritter it just simply had you know corn and egg yolk and just a little bit of flour and they were delicate and so so tasty you know a lot, a lot of our, our, our northern and, and, uh, and west coast friends and european friends they wouldn't understand that's just that's 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 real food that's real food it is absolutely real food <laughs> and you know another thing about all the corn that we have this time of year is corn salad i love fresh tomatoes with some peppers and onions <clears throat> cut up chopped up shave that corn off, put it with those tomatoes, and, and, and man, do I love a good corn salad. You know, good, Malcolm, gotta, gotta... Uh, Trudy Fisher was on our show. You know, she's the barbecue champion, and mm-hmm. not this time, but last time she was on, she gave us a recipe for corn salad, and she grills the corn, and it's just so easy because you just literally throw it on the grill and grill it for two minutes and then two minutes on each side you grill it for about 10 or 12 minutes and then cut it off and it takes your corn salad to a different level well i gotta remind y'all i had three ears <laughs> <laughs> and they were like and they were like pure gold i mean the cost of the raised bed and the dirt and the fertilizer and all that kind of stuff you know you can't you know if i had a big guard it'd be one thing but what i've done is uh, i used an old horticultural recipe called three sisters have y'all heard of that before no this is something that was done in uh what's now called mexico the aztecs and and all them used to do this they found that if you planted corn and squash and beans together in a mound and they put had a lot of little mounds the three had a synergistic effect. The corn needed nitrogen, which is more. The beans provided. The beans needed something to climb on. The corn provided. Uh, they all need the the squash needed uh, protection from things. So they would plant uh, a little group of corn, and around it some beans, and around that some squash. And it's an incredibly good looking thing, but it's also a historic thing. And a lot of people are stuck at home. Not stuck at home. They're 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 challenged to be at home with their children right now. And this is that little social thing about history and, and, and culture. But uh, between the corn and the squash and the beans, that's a perfect combination horticulturally, and it's also a balanced meal nutritionally. It well, it is like that you're growing succotash. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that which is which is an succotash American thing. on a mound. Yep, 
And we, we, you know, we, oh, we, we owe, we owe and, and, and what I've done is I've got three little, I'm looking right now, I planted some more uh, last week, week and a half ago, I guess. And right now the corn's about knee high and the, and the squash is, uh, it, it, it looks good. You can plant stuff like this as flowers or in containers, summer stuff. Uh, up until about the second week or so in August. Another couple of weeks or so, you can still plant tomatoes and peppers and corn and squash and beans and still get a harvest before fall. Or, or else you can wait another month and start setting out uh, broccoli and cabbage and you know lettuce in the cool season thing. But we still have plenty of time for a good-looking second. We have enough time in, the, in Mississippi to have two back-to-back summer gardens, whereas our friends up north hope that they have one. Right. Right. So, <clears throat> Felder, how how is your luck with tomatoes? Are you uh, one of those people who can can no. can just without a lot of effort grow tomatoes, or do you struggle with them? I plant tomatoes every year, Malcolm, because they give me hope. But they don't, <laughs> you know, you know, they don't make very well. I tend to over fertilize. I tell people don't over fertilize. The I go out in the mornings. I've got these beautiful uh, tomatoes about to ripen, and the possums have eaten half of them. So what I what I do. What I do, and this is a very gestalt thing, is I take a Sharpie pen on my green tomatoes and draw smiley faces on them because that might be all I get. <laughs> I'm, I'm not making this up. Smiley faces, <laughs> just in case, that's all I get. But some people grow tomatoes like ringing a bell, and, you know, I've written a book, and I can't do it. I just can't do it. But peppers, <laughs> peppers, and oak and I've never had it. much luck either. I've got a bunch of pots of, uh, uh, you know, cherry tomatoes that are doing great but yeah I, I put my my creoles in my in the ground or my better boys in the ground and lo and behold they beautiful plants and i just don't ever get much fruit well i got a friend named jesse yancey who, who has a he's a, a gorilla garden he guard, gardens in a little area of a small neighborhood in jackson uh, on, a, on a street lot that's not his his property but he grows great tomatoes and I, I take uh, okra and stuff like that and swap for tomatoes. They also got some great big ones at the farmer's market. And we have farmer's markets all over the state. And they socially distance and all that. But there's some great tomatoes <laughs> at the farmer's markets. Yeah, I got my Creoles from Jesse this year. So I was hoping some of that would rub off on me. But so far, I've just got a bunch of hard green tomatoes. But you know what? I think I'll go out there and draw some smiley faces on them. I like see that what idea. happens. Or frowny well, faces I, I, or I'm not growing any tomatoes, but I sure am buying a whole lot. I buy about eight or ten at the first of every week, and we pretty much eat them at every meal. And then last week, I, I did a fried green tomato BLT, and John says that we're not going to be having regular BLTs anymore. He was pretty happy about that fried green tomato. Well, one, one thing What's I'm doing a lot of is jalapenos. My jalapeno peppers are doing great. I leave them on the vine till they get red. It looks so. And you know, I make Mexican cornbread, and jalapenos and cornbread are just go hand in hand. Yeah, I've got a, a late garden, uh, Felder, that's just sort of getting up squash, peppers, uh, tomatoes. I waited until after the, uh, you know, the really planting time, and so we'll see what happens. So far, so good. Uh, yeah. but, but that, that, that uh, planting time, And I heard you talk about the second season, too. Yeah, planting time is based on agriculture practices. You know, when I'm in England, they, they can't plant until around what we call uh, uh, Memorial Day, and they hope to harvest before Labor Day. But farmers plant for the long haul. Gardeners plant a little at a time. When, uh, when, when, when some of my plants get uh, harvested or, <clears throat> or they die, I pull them up stick something else in the hole, and I'm ready to go. You know, gardening is more like home cooking. You know, you don't have to eat that whole thing of macaroni and cheese at once. Right, right. Well, Felder, we sure do appreciate you getting on the phone with us and sharing your tidbits of wisdom and uh, your ability to uh, grow things and to make us all laugh and feel good about life. Uh, well, the Gestalt you know, Gardener comes on every Friday right here on MPB Think Radio. That's right. Your host, you, Felder Rusher, is the man. If you can't laugh in your garden, where can you? Good to see y'all. <laughs> exactly. Y'all have fun. All right. Well, one thing I've learned from Felder, from listening to him for many years, is this concept of soaking. He he talks about the difference between watering your plants and watering your garden and giving them a good soak. And I, I have learned that from him, and I have found that it is very useful, uh, and it works 
very well. Carol, it's time for us to take our last break of, of the show. We'll come back. We'll continue our conversation about figs and cobblers and whether the dollop of ice cream or whip topping goes on top, on top of that. We'll take your calls, one eight seven seven mpb ring Or if you want to shoot us an email, we'd be love to see that at uh, food, MPB online. Carol and I will be right back to wrap up the show. We hope to hear from you. Thank you for tuning in. We'll be right back. If you're a parent on the go, but still want to stay informed about your children's education, subscribe to Mississippi Education Connections podcast and listen on the go anytime, anywhere on your favorite podcast app. Don't touch that dial. You are tuned to Deep South Dining with Carol Puckett, Malcolm White, and Java Chapman. And we appreciate Felder Rushing getting on the phone with us there for a few minutes and sharing uh, his wisdom. We started out talking about figs, but we've also talked a lot about gardening and fruit bushes and fruit plants and different kinds of cobblers and sweet dishes. And Carol, somewhere you were telling me that there's an actual fig festival Yes, there is. And uh, Dr. Marcy Ferris, who has been a guest of ours from North Carolina, uh, tweeted out this morning that the Okra Coke Fig Festival in North Carolina is going online this year. So, of course, I was fascinated by an online fig festival. And, (laughs) (laughs) And it started reading about this island. It's called Okra Coke Island. And it's an island on the southernmost end of the Outer Banks. And they are well known for their figs. In fact, there there are 15 varieties of these old growth figs on that island. And it's their thing. You know, if Felder were still on the phone, I would ask him how on earth you can grow figs in sandy, salty soil. But there must be a way because the people in Okra Coke, North Carolina, have figured it out. Well, they say that the fig trees thrive in that environment, but um, I I wanted to mention it, too, because they say some of the lineages go back, actually, two centuries. Wow. That's that's pretty wild. And it says that you stir up, you would stir up a small scandal if anybody lets their figs ripen and fall to the ground without making something. Wow. So they have an actual festival that they has, do. has gone online because of the COVID-19. Yeah. And the most famous recipe at the festival is a fig cake. It was first made 50 or 60 years ago by a woman named Margaret Garish. And it was an accident because she was making a date cake and didn't have dates. So she put figs in it. And I sent that recipe to Java to post online because I certainly want to try it, and I know you will. You will too. But um, an old timey fig cake recipe. That's an old cake. That thing's got to be getting stale by now. It has to be getting stale now. Fifty something year old cake. Yeah. Hey, one uh, more thing, Mal. They're having the bake off, the fig cake bake off online. You submit your recipe with photographs and recorded testimonials from from friends and family. I mean, I would load that thing up going around and getting testimonials from you and from Java and, you know, all sorts of friends because I would want to win the online contest. Well, of course, if you entered it, you would win it. You'd be all in. No, no fig would have a chance uh, if Carol entered. So I sent you that uh, that little article out of BuzzFeed that I saw online. And it says the 37 things for anyone who spends basically all of their time in the kitchen. And my favorite was the cushy floor mat so that your feet uh, don't ache all the time from standing on a cold, hard kitchen floors for hours and hours and hours while you prep your favorite dishes. Well, that was certainly a very practical one, but as I scanned through these, I found that really the whole purpose of this article was to sell things, you know, new things on Amazon, but one of the things I thought was going to be your favorite thing is the automatic stirrer. <laughs> it, is, it is this thing that looks like a, a kind of like a spaceship. I mean, it, it has 
three legs coming down and you put it in your skillet, it would be great for room making. But that, that really caught my attention. Yeah. I might get it to you. I know your your birthday's <laughs> not till March, so <laughs> oh, for retire for your uh, exit from the arts commission. That's what I'm going to give An you. An automatic stirrer. Wow. Well, after I saw that list, I started making my own list of things that yeah I must have to cook with, and I know you have some too. But the newest thing I have that has really changed my life is an infrared digital laser thermometer. I saw that one. That looked pretty practical. Well, the one they had you actually stick in the meat, but the one I'm talking about, you actually shoot the surface of, like, oil. So when you're frying and you're trying to get to 350, you don't have to, like, balance a a thermometer on the side. I mean, you just pull the trigger and shoot the surface of the oil and it, it's really changed my cooking and and my you know excitement to you know when John says like, give me some fried oysters for lunch yeah no longer do I dread you know, getting out that thermometer and balancing it on the side you just shoot it yeah well you know going back to the old days when I got in the restaurant business we would drizzle a little water in the oil. Uh, to see if it popped and it, it, you know, if it was ready uh, for for the food to be dropped into it or not. Well, you know, really great cooks do that, and they also also can just see and feel and smell the oil. I'm I'm not one of those. I'm very reliant on a thermometer. So, what what is one of your favorite kitchen tools? Uh, in this list or in my no, kitchen? No, no, you're really in your kitchen. Well, you know, a good set of knives uh, is everything, and and I tell you, I I'm bad about not sharpening my knives, and I that's terrible because when you reach over there and grab a knife, it needs to be well taken care of and sharp, and I often wait until I need it to realize that I haven't sharpened it. So, uh, I need to work on uh, taking some time out and sharpening my knives and keeping my tools in good shape so that when I need them, they're ready to rock. Well, I think an eight-inch chef's knife and a four-inch paring knife are must-haves in the kitchen. And you need one of those two-stage knife sharpeners. It and, you know, really doesn't take anything. You just pick it up in your hand and you slide your knife through yeah. the V and, you know, it'll change your life. Well, I've got the tool there. I just, I, I don't do my maintenance, but... Um... But anyway, sure was great to get Felder on to talk a little bit about uh, his successes and failures and to keep us laughing. That's every Friday on MPB Think Radio, Felder Rushing and the Gestalt Gartner. You know, Felder, uh, he he's comes on food shows, he comes on art shows, and he has his own show. That dude is well-rounded. He is a renaissance man. And he's got that truck, that green truck full of plants in the back and i hope he's never looking for anonymity because there's no way he could hide anywhere anytime felder rushing does not crave anonymity (laughs) and that's a beautiful thing for all of us true enough well carol thanks again uh this has been deep south dining we are a production of mississippi public broadcasting's think radio we are funding by generous contributions from listeners just like you our show is very artfully produced by Java Chapman. Our co-host, Carol Puckett, and I really appreciate you joining us. Thanks to Felder Rushing again for being on our show today. Stay tuned now for Now You're Talking with Marshall Ramsey, followed by Southern Remedy at 11. And join us every Monday at 9 a.m. for Deep South Dining right here on MPB Think Radio.